I can start with um, yeah, I was just making a quick introduction. Okay, right. Um, uh, hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Wolf. I'm the Associate Director for the Media Center here at the Logan Center for the Arts. Um, I like, I'm glad you're all here to, to check out this presentation uh, by Sean Hogan, who's uh, in the college at the University of Chicago discuss his game, uh, Anodyne, and uh, we hope that you uh, enjoy the rest of the events this afternoon and tomorrow, and uh, come back for more events at the Logan Center in the future. So without further ado, here's Sean. Thanks. Right. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Sean Hogan. I'm a third year at the college, and this is a video game that I'm working on. It's called Anodyne. Um, so today... I just thought I'd talk a bit about, sort of about games in general at first, just for those um, not in the know, and then sort of describe what exactly the game is, and then after that, some more interesting stuff, I'll talk about a bit of the, I guess, the aesthetic decisions we made in designing a few of the areas in the game, and after that, I'll talk a bit about game design and exactly what that is, um, sort of how, you know, you design the game in a way that allows players to actually be able to immerse themselves in it and make progress through the game. And then at the end, I'll talk a bit more about how the game is exactly made. That is, you know, how do we write the music, how is the art made, how does that get into the game, how is the game actually created, you know, magic code and whatnot. Um, and then if we have time, I'll talk a bit about, uh, or open up questions if anyone's curious about anything. Um, so Anodyne is it's an adventure game, an adventure video game by two people, uh, me. I do the programming, I write the music, sound effects, and I do most of the level design. And then my friend John Kataka, who is off at Carleton College, and he does the art work for everything in the game, and he also helps to write the dialogue for the story. This is a lot better of words. And the uh, pictures. Um, so yeah, we collaborate sort of on how the story takes shape and other small game design things. So like, you know, maybe I have an idea and it doesn't work very well and he'll be like, that's stupid and we'll throw it out. Um, so Anodyne started as a sort of a side project back in March when I was around releasing another game. And it didn't really take off until around the end of June when I met John through a friend. And he started working on the art and it's been three months and it's doing pretty well, we're close to finishing, uh, game's not done yet, we want to finish by late November or early December, um, and then we're going to release it on Desura and Gamersgate currently for like 8 bucks, um, Desura and Gamersgate, they're basically, if you know what Steam is, they're basically that, um, if you don't know what Steam is, Steam, Desura, Gamersgate are like Best Buy or GameStop, except on the internet, so you buy the game and you download it and it's on your computer immediately. Um, so, what's an adventure game, if you're not familiar? So, abstractly, since I know everyone here likes that, um, video games are just sets of images and sounds on a screen that are manipulated by some sort of input, usually a player on the computer, usually like a keyboard and the mouse. Um, adventure, in terms of the game genre, is usually, you know, you control a character, you explore some, you know, unknown lands, and there's some overlying quests to carry you through the game, usually. So, to give some context on how sort of Anodyne fits into this, I want to talk a bit about a little bit of history, not too much. But, so in the past decade, games have become a lot easier for very small groups of people to create. You know, people, uh, groups of one to three. Um, in the past, like the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to actually make a living off of making games, then you needed teams with Know, ten or more people, you needed a lot of money to do this because it wasn't a trivial affair, like you had to have all this hardware and space to work, and it wasn't very easy. Um, so here's some like familiar titles that were very, had pretty large teams in the past. Um, so this still happens today, and those kinds of games are called AAA games. They have teams, sometimes over a hundred people. And you, these are the ones you buy for like your PS3, your Xbox 360, uh, Wii, so forth. Um, you know, 
Whereas now, in the past five years, since technology has developed, this lets groups of one to three people, or maybe a few more, um, make you know really great games on a low or maybe even non-existent budget, except for their time. And if they sell it well enough, they can even make a living compared to you know, past years. And what this has done is allowed games to become a sort of a, a more accessible creative medium, just because the tools are there to let people sort of make games easier, and also allow people who want to do it for a living to at least try to. Um, so some like very successful games developed by small groups. These are all mainly developed by two people, Super Meat Boy, Braid, and Fez. They've sold you know, millions of copies. Well, Fez hasn't, but the first two have. Um, yeah. So John and I's game contribution to this sort of medium of games is currently anodyne, and hopefully we'll finish it. I think we can. Um, right. So, what do you do in Anodyne? Um, you control this character called Young on a quest through sort of his dream world. Well, it's not necessarily a boy, but it's easy to refer to him as a he. Um, the game has a start and end, so it's very much an adventure, but there is some non-linearity, and what I mean by that is that you, know, you can sort of choose where you want to go to next in the game, rather than the game always just telling you, you know, you have to go to this next place to produce. Um, for the familiar, the gameplay is sort of Zelda style, and what that means is that it's 2D, it's top down. Um, so, I mean, as I was playing earlier, if you didn't see it, you know, it's not, it's kind of like an isometric view, you sort of see the front of objects and so forth. Um, the aesthetic influences are influenced by this game called Yume Nikki. And I, don't, I don't understand the word top-down adventure. Right. Defining things. So top-down refers to the view. So, so the perspective is sort of, it's not, it's not, um, it's not looking at, like, the side. Perspective. Yeah, the perspective is sort of as if like there's a camera kind of pointing down at an angle in okay. the room. Okay. And then, and then the adventure is just it's an adventure game that sort of defined earlier, except with this perspective for the graphics. Um. Yeah. So there's this game called Yume Nikki, and it has very strong aesthetics, and by that I mean that all of the areas really work well together and give the like feeling of being in a dream, and I use that game as sort of a reference in designing the areas in this game and kind of thinking of ways to sort of strongly keep the areas together in terms of how they feel. It's a very poorly defined word, but it's the best I can say. Um, right, so you explore areas, um, some pictures of places in the game. You explore dungeons, and so more definitions. Dungeons are just a bunch of these uh, juxtaposed rooms. So right now this is the dungeon, and this is one room. And if you go to the left, here's another room. Um, so there's a little like map of the dungeon. And the point of a dungeon is you come in at point A, and you have to make it through all of these rooms, you know, fighting enemies and so forth, to make it to the end. Um, and that allows you to progress in the overlying game. On the right here is, you can't really see it, but that's a, one of the dungeons zoomed out a lot, so you can kind of see how these dungeons form a grid pattern. Um, there's also more abstract areas, so maybe more like, by abstract I mean they're not really tied down to any, a lot of realistic architecture or anything. So on the left is a good example, it's just this like blank area, we'll see it in motion in a bit, and on the right is, it's not realistic architecture, you know gates and cement don't float, and so forth. Um, right, so you explore these areas and overcome challenges and so forth, and that reveals more about the story and the game and allows you to make progress through it. Uh, right, so I've already shown the game in motion, so we won't do that. We will again in a bit, though. Um, right, so the aesthetics and layout of the game, um, the areas is sort of touched on before, they move between more realistic, like nature-like areas, maybe like a forest, or a beach, 
or more like fantasy areas. So one of them is hard to describe. It's kind of like a very wide open, like just dark area with totally unrealistic architecture. And these areas are sort of grouped together. And so as you progress through the game, you know, one part of the game is mostly more realistic areas, and after that is more abstract. And that helps to tie in with the story and the dialogue in order to better convey the themes of the game. It's kind of hard to explain, but we'll, we'll see more about aesthetics. Um, okay. So, what I'm going to do now is and I'm going to sort of going to play through some of the intro areas of the game, and then after I sort of walk through an area, we'll I'll discuss some of the aesthetic decisions that we made. Um, okay. Right. So this is just the title screen of the game. Um, it might still be a placeholder, but titles are kind of important for I think for giving a feel of what the game is. So in this case, the song is sort of. I guess warm and dreamlike, at least what I had in mind when trying to write it. And then, yeah, so I read the music for the game. Um, and the picture John drew sort of gives a hint as for what the game will have. So you know, the adventure and sort of the mysterious, foreboding atmosphere. Okay, anyways, so we'll start the game and. I'm not really concerned about design at this point, so I'm just going to skip through a lot of this dialogue. Right, so this is the first area in the game that the player sees, and there's not, as you can tell, there's not a lot of visual noise. The art is pretty, like, minimal, and the music is also not in your face. It's just sort of ambient and, uh, like, wave-like, almost, just a lot of like white noise kind of manipulated in weird ways. Um, like, again, not a lot of words or dialogue to get in the player's way because the purpose of this area is to both um, both act as like an immersion, immersion for the player into the game world and also get them acquainted with the very base set of interactions which are just moving around and interacting. So you need a keyboard to play this game? Yeah. So the game is for PC, Mac, and Linux, so basically your computer. Um, and I hope if you have a computer you have a keyboard. <laughs> that would be tragic if you don't. Um, <laughs> I guess they have like touch screen computers now. Uh, right. So Let me be completely stupid. So, could you play this on an iPad? Uh, not, which is iOS 6. Not yet, because it's only... We have there, The thing that we use allows it to be played on an iPad sort of easily, but I would have to program some more stuff so that I could use you know, the touchscreen to control stuff. Um, that's something I'm thinking about in the future after we release it for the computer. So right now we just want to get the game out, and then after that... We'll think if it does okay, we'll see, you know, is it worth the time to put it onto, you know, tablets and, touch and smartphones. Which would be pretty fun, um, if it works out. Uh, I'll come to that after this, actually. So, okay, so... Right. So, anyways, the player gets to that area, and they come to the this, like, dark area with slightly more realistic architecture. Um, it's a little more relatable because you can talk to stuff like this rock. Um, and, right, so just, don't worry about that. So this area acts as sort of a central, like, nexus for the game. So the player will, I just can think of it like a train station maybe. Like, the player will come here a lot and use it to access other areas in the game. Um, so in relation to the area before this, the art is more concrete, as in, you know, there's tiles now, there's sort of brick, and if I go over here, you see these, you know, art gate 
ways, which lead to different areas. Um, so we wanted to keep that sort of like progression of how realistic the place looks. Uh, the song is kind of the song is just like a single synth, and it's it sort of borders on melodic, but not really. And that is to also sort of go along with uh, like the art also becoming more relatable. And it also helps work with giving this area sort of a mysterious feel because it's a bit expansive at first, and you know you don't really know where any of these go at first. But you know the man in the it does tell you, okay, you know, go to the left and we'll see this next area. Sort of like the realism of the realism. I don't even know what that word means. Um, like the realistic, like architecture of the art and sort of the song having melodies. Like now the song actually is a defined melody and like time signature and whatnot. And the art is immediately relatable. It's a street and it. The purpose of all this sort of related to the game is that it gives the player the idea that the whole game isn't just going to be these weird abstract areas, that sometimes there's going to be a lot of places with uh, more you know, realistic architecture, like if I just hop over here, like this, this one kind of looks like an apartment, and so forth. Yeah, at this point, the art, art and music are still mysterious and a little, like, dark, foreboding. Just because the first few areas in the game, we kind of wanted to give everything that feels so that you can kind of relate to, you know, maybe the beginnings of a dream or whatnot, you know, being sort of unclear and so forth. Um, okay. Yeah, and relative to other areas in the game, there's not a lot of sensory noise. There hasn't really been a lot of noise visually and uh, musically in these areas, and that's because in the introduction parts of the game, you know, you don't want to overwhelm a player with too much stuff because they're still, you know, getting their feet wet in the game and so forth. So, as you can see, the art here is pretty minimal, and the music isn't in your face, even though it does have a melody. So we'll come back to this place in a bit, because I do want to discuss the game design of this area. Um, I think tutorials are sort of an interesting point to talk about. Maybe you'll fall asleep, but hopefully not. Uh, okay. And so I have this, like, debug. You can't actually do this in the game, but um, <laughs> just ignore this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if only. That's how you win, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's placeholder art, um, not final. <laughs> um, okay, so this is sort of one. Of, this is one of like the nature areas, as I was saying. They're all next to each other. So the beach is next to a, a like plain, which is next to the forest, next to a cliff. Um, and it's a. It's, they sort of sor serve as a, like a calm part of the game. You know, in re in contrast to the more like very like aggressive areas that come later. Uh, as for the design of this place, so when I first wrote the song, you know, if you can hear the synths and stuff, they're sort of, I don't know, wave-like wave -like maybe? They kind of like ebb and flow and they're sort of warm, but at the same time it's not a very happy song, it's still a little bit mysterious, which is kind of something we wanted to keep through the whole game. Uh, the art itself is, you know, calming, I think as are the waves, but it's not a super, like, cheery um, art style. And I think those two sort of work together well to sort of give the whole feel of this area. Um, at least that's what we did. Uh, what else? Okay. So, no game for now. Right, so I wanted to talk about so how do we sort of just develop the aesthetics of the area? Well, 
So first, I, us I usually have like a rough idea for a place and kind of how it fits in the game. You know, what exactly do I want the purpose of this place to be? And you know, maybe I'll like write a song for it or design the area structure and whatnot. And then you know, I'll give John some details visually as to you know how do we want to make this place feel. And then John works with magic, and then you know, boom, there's a place you can actually see. But of course, like. Nothing's really planned from the start. It's just like a rough idea that we sort of, you know, I guess, shape and mold as development goes on. So, like, a lot of these areas go under a lot of revision in terms of how they feel. And kind of an arduous process, but it's nice to see in the end when it works out. How do you decide how many areas you're going to develop in a game? Is there a certain amount of gameplay time you expect from, from the product entirely? Is there a, a minimal? Curious, huh? Yeah, so when I started working on the game, I had a like a very rough sense of scale. Like I was like, okay, I want some number of these areas that aren't dungeons, and I want some number of areas that are dungeons. And you know, you start making the first few areas, you kind of see, okay, how much time, how much time is it taking me to make these, and also how long does it take the player to get through these areas. And as that goes along, you, find, you start to get a little more comfortable with deciding exactly what the final structure of the entire game world is. And that was a process that was also very like iterative. I mean, everything really is with game development and I guess a lot of other creative things. Um, so I think it was about like end of July, mid-July, that we finally decided on the final structure of the world and how every area relates to each other. Um, yeah, so that's all, that's, well, that was also a tough process. I mean, there's not like a super procedural way to decide you know, exactly what to do, but you kind of just make a guess and it usually works out all right. So you're simultaneously coming up with an overall aesthetic, um, with a possibly story, and also the structure, how many rooms, how are they going to move in. You're basically developing all these ideas at the same time. Yeah, sort of. I mean, the ideas for the aesthetics came first. Like, I was like, okay, I want something dreamlike, and I have these ideas that I want to try expressing through it. So, um, it's not all totally improvised. Like, some of it kind of feels improvised, but they all, I always do have, you know, the original base intent in mind when, like, designing these places, which helps it not to become a disorganized train wreck. Um, how, different, how different would it be is it from your original idea to where you're at right now? Um... It's a little more traditional gameplay-wise, and by that I mean there's more clearly defined goals. So what happened at first was that, you know, I wanted something that was very just exploratory and not really a lot of direction in the game. And as development went on, so I talked to John and we kind of went back and forth and I realized, okay, that's kind of something hard to do this early in like, my experience of game development. So he, he kind of helped me to be like, okay, we should make things a little more concrete and game-like just for the sake of finishing, you know, this. And so that's probably the biggest difference from the original vision is that the gameplay is more clearly defined. But nothing else has really changed too much. Um, yeah. So, uh, right. so what's the point of aesthetics? Um, I guess I touched on some of these. Aesthetics increases the immersion in the game. Um, it can increase the player's curiosity to keep playing in the game as to you know what else lies in the world. And I think that combining you know some a little bit of dialogue, actually the interaction, the gameplay, uh, the artwork, and the music can help to convey ideas that aren't easily conveyed in words. Maybe this is done bad with words. Um, and at the same time. The aesthetics also can act as another layer over the main game story and the main gameplay. So it's not necessary to, you know, get the aesthetics. Like, that's definitely not something we want to force upon the player. Like, you can play the game and just, you know, read the basic story and just enjoy the game. Or if you want, you know, you can kind of dig into, you know, why did the developers you know, decide to make stuff in this way and how can that relate to other things and so forth. Um, so that's, like, a big thing that I'm kind of is important to me is to not sort of force force interpretations on the player. Like like a lot of games will be like this game is about desire or something and I don't know, I find that annoying, but that's just me. Right. Okay. 
So, I'll talk a little bit about game design, and after that we'll talk about how the game is actually made. Um, so, the things about game design I'm going to talk about are how the intro areas provide a, like a minimal set of actions to give the player to be able to make it through the game. Um, the tough thing about, well, we'll just talk about it in a second after we actually play it. Right, so, this is the tutorial dungeon, so to speak. Um, it comes after, so, at this point, the player already knows how to move around and how to interact with things in a very basic fashion. But, a big portion of the game is these very large dungeons. So, this dungeon is only eight rooms, but by the end of the game, some of them are 60 rooms large, and, um, I guess... The larger a dungeon gets, it's not necessarily linearly more difficult. It kind of like never mind. Anyways, <laughs> um, right. So immediately when they're here, you know, the only choice the player has is to go forward. And in this room, so to the north, this is actually like a lock, but the player doesn't know that. But you know, all the player knows is to press C. I'm not supposed to have that item yet. So, you know, the player will just stand here, maybe, and realize, okay, I can't do anything with that. Um, if they go to the left, you know, they see what's a gate. Maybe they don't know it's a gate, and they see these red things. And, um, if they run into them enough, then they'll die. Okay. A lot of great glitches. Top right. Um, yeah, so they can't do anything here. You're like, you know, maybe they run into them until they die, and they're like, okay, maybe I should go to the right. That's the only other choice they have. Um, there's not much going on in this room. And then here, what's in front of the player is a button, and buttons can open gates. And even though the player doesn't know that that's a button or that's a gate, eventually, at least you hope, you know, they'll walk onto the button and then make the connection that, wait, the thing I stepped on, you know, open the gate, and have in the back of their mind that, you know, sometimes step on buttons because they open gates. This is the game. Um, not really a realistic thing, but okay. And so this is the room where you sort of learn about combat, which is an important aspect in getting through dungeons. So the player will either hear, you know, realize, okay, you know, these things kill me if they didn't realize it earlier, and then there's this box. You know, walking into it doesn't do anything, but all they know to do is to press C and interact, so they get this, like, broom thing. Tells you, okay, um, you know, proceed to attack. And you, know, you can attack this treasure box, you can attack the gate, and it doesn't do anything. So the only thing left to do is attack the slimes. And then, you know, you hit them enough, and die. Right. Uh, which, hopefully, so now they either haven't gone to the left or they have, and if they have, then they'll realize, okay, now I should, you know, I realized earlier that, you know, killing all the slimes lowered the gate, so maybe I should do that here, too. Um, so, sort of what's happening is just, I'm just like, this dungeon, I think, is very over-designed, like, every single room went under a number of, like, provisions, but that's only because it's really important to, you know, help the player understand the basic mechanics of the game so that they can remain immersed, so that... You know, later in the game, when they come to a harder room, they're not, like, stuck, and they get frustrated, and then they're just like, I hate this game. But, and that would kind of kill the point of making it, because, you know, you want them to play through the whole thing and sort of get as much out of it as they can. Um, right here again is just reinforcing, again, the whole combat thing. You know, you can feel the slime go through here. Um, yeah, this room... This room is mostly just to sort of show that there's some, you know, more strange, surreal things that happen in the game, but don't necessarily hurt you. <coughs> that guy following you, and then, okay, the player gets here, can only go to the right. Um, so even though the players don't, so I watch a lot of people play this dungeon, and, you know, people don't always figure out if they should go to the next room, but the thing is that the dungeon is so small, and that there's, there aren't a lot of choices that eventually, that they, off, they eventually they just reach the decision, well, they all that's left is them for to like go into some room and you know, make things easy. Uh, right. So these things are like clouds of dust, and you can like pick them up and move them around into the room. And 
what usually happens if I started a, like a brand new game is that if I hit this dust thing, a little like pop up will show up and you know tell you you can move these things around. And as you as you've kind of seen, there's been a few of these like dialogue pop ups when you do things for the first time in the game, and I'm not really a fan of you know always saying telling the player what to do, but you know, I was talking to John, and he was like, oh yeah, well, sometimes there's these, like, mechanics in the game that you just really are near impossible to teach without just telling the person, so you're better off just making sure they know rather than just having them confused as hell, because before, that's what would happen with these people would be like, what do these do? Like, and so forth. And, uh, these dust things play a big role in all the dungeons. They, like, they're central to a lot of the mechanics. Um, Sometimes they can block like projectiles. Sometimes you can ride them as like sort of a raft and so forth. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of a rundown of the design of that tutorial area, and you know, hopefully that kind of gives an appreciation for all the thought that usually goes into tutorials in like video games, because a lot of it does. And you know, if you script the tutorial, then people are going to be confused that they won't play the game and so forth. So, the next, next thing was you know, talking about how the game is made. Uh, I guess we kind of went over this design-wise. So, you know, there's the brainstorming of ideas. And then, after, as you make enough games, you know, you get better at filtering out the crap ideas. Um, you know, sometimes people throw out ideas that are just totally, you know, out there and unrealistic. But as you build up enough practice, then you get a sense for, you know, what will actually work, and then you can move on to implementation, which is, you know, coding the game, and creating the art for it, and writing the music, and after, you know, that base set of things is done, then you can work on, you know, iterating and tweaking stuff, and, you know, polishing the game. Uh, right. So, I can talk about a lot of these for, like, entire talks, but I'm mostly going to focus on implementation, just to sort of, you know, show you how exactly, you know, we make this game. Okay, so I might just skip this. Who's familiar with programming? Okay, at least three. Okay, that's worth talking about it. Um, if you're not, just tune out because it's going to sound like a different language. So I program everything in the Flash Develop IDE. Um, so like, here's my code and so forth. And I use the ActionScript 3 framework called Flixel, and it's really nice for you know, making games very quickly. It helps you with like you know dealing with drawing sprites and managing other things. Um, as for how the game works, there's this one big manager class that deals with instantiating different parts of the map and also instantiating objects, you know, and checking for when players die and so forth. Um, okay, and, the, and, of course, we want to keep track of things that have happened in the game. So, you know, maybe how many times the players died, you know, what bosses have been killed, and for that you have this sort of global context called a registry. And that just stores a lot of state information that gets like serialized to the save file and so forth. Um, and other things, maybe you're curious about events. How events work is they're just like a bunch of like blocking calls, so like a big switch statement. So maybe what'll happen is like I have a cutscene, and what it'll be is like have this have this person move to the right until they get past a certain point, and when that happens, have a, a rock fall from the ceiling or something. Uh, yeah. And the enemies, I call them, like, scripty state machines. If that makes sense to you, then it does. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, it's kind of a messy part of the code, the enemies, because a lot of enemies do need global access to the other enemies on the screen in order to have specific interactions. So, like, one of the ideas is that, so in one part of the game, there's, like, these, like, flame pillars that come from the ground, and then the dust also blocks them. So, in the part of the code for the dust, you have to make sure that the dust, like, knows, you know, if these fire pillars are on the screen, so that it can check stuff about them. Um, yeah. The level data is stored as comma-separated values, so I use this level editor. Um, I can show you the level we were just playing through. And I'll explain how we actually do this in a bit. So the level data gets exported as just text CSV, and the enemy positions gets exported as XML, which is
which is kind of a crappy storage format, but you know, whatever. Okay. So now you can listen if you had no idea what that was. Um, right, so how do we make the art? Well, as I said earlier, the art starts as sort of a visual description I give to John, and I've been getting better, I think, at describing this. At first, I was pretty bad at communicating with artists, and I think I've gotten better at that, you know, sort of saying, giving them enough information to know what to make, and so forth. That's a nice skill. Um, so on the left is, like, a concept art that John drew after I, like, described an area for him, and then the right is the actual area in-game. So I think John does a really good job of creating art that fits well with the music I have, so I'm glad to have him uh, be working with him. And on the left is a very tiny, shrunk-down um, concept art thing that I just put there. Uh, yeah, so... I'll describe, you know, what needs to happen in this area, so you know, you know, are there enemies here and whatnot, you know, description, and also how it fits into the game thematically. And so for dungeons, I'll design the level entirely, and John will paint over it. So, or an example of that. Yeah, so what I mean by that is, on the left, I'll actually make the dungeon myself with this, like, filler tile set, and then I'll describe the area to John, and he'll tile over it with you know, something magic and amazing, like on the right. Um, and for areas that aren't as structured as dungeons, what I'll do is I'll make like a sketch and have deets. So on the bottom left is a sketch of one of the areas, and it'll have like points of interest that I'll tell John about, and I'll sort of give him an idea for the scale of the area so that he's not totally lost when he's trying to do it. And yeah. I think it gives them a little more freedom, I think, in terms of drawing stuff. And as for how this stuff actually gets in the game, so in games, in 2D games, as opposed to 3D games, there's things called sprite sheets and tile sets. And what sprite sheets are, they are just the frames of animation of something. So on the bottom right is the sprite sheet of the player. So as you can see, there's different frames for walking and jumping and falling down holes and attacking. And I'll use the sprite sheet in the game code, and I'll, you know, I'll tell the game you know, how to use this and how to animate the player and so forth. And the top right, if you can see it, is something called a tile set. And tile sets are just a series of these squares of little images. And you can use them to paint over stuff in the game. So right now, oops. so this here is a tile set for the street area, and, you know, I can change what the place looks like. And if I save the game and export it, then when we, when we go into the game, you'll see that, you know, terrible mess. <laughs> um, so let's undo that. And, yeah, tile sets act as sort of like the visual building blocks for 2D games, for the most part, unless you have something very fancy. Um, yeah. So that's sort of like his work, I'm not sure if his exact workflow, but that's sort of the pipeline for how we get art into the game from an idea. Um, so for when I write the music, I use, so I already have like a rough idea of how I want the area to feel, how I want it to fit into the game, so I kind of think about, you know, what kind of mood and energy the area should have, and then I sort of, you know, like my choice of instrument to work out ideas on is just a keyboard or piano, so I'll just like sit down for a bit and try to work out like a small melody, and then if I have something that seems like it might be okay as a melody, then I'll go over to my... DAW, I'll show you what that is, in a, and then I'll work it out on the computer. Um, so what a DAW is, is it's called a Digital Audio Workstation, and it lets you... So for professional like music artists, they use it to master you know, a lot of tracks, or like mix and master tracks, so like you know, maybe the drums and the guitar, but for video game music, what you do, well, like, what I do is, so I use this like piano roll, What this is, is it lets me sort of, it's kind of like sheet music, like you, if you know, like, play your pianos, you'll, like, draw on the notes and how long you want them to play and how loud they should be, so, right, so, you know, you can, like, write a melody and so forth, and pick the instruments you want to map to them, so, like, this is one of the songs later in the game, um, and of course you can, like, change the sounds around and make everything just sound wrong. Sounds actually okay, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And with 
in this, you know, there's a lot of like effects you can do. So what happens is, you know, you write out the song and that gets mapped through some sort of like virtual instrument to, you know, pick what it should sound like. And then you can also run it through these like effects and stuff to give it certain moods. So, you know, you can just you can do like terrible stuff. And Yeah, so that's sort of how the music's written. Um, kill that. I'll have like an idea, and then I'll go into there and work it out. And sometimes, you know, you, I end up throwing away a song like three or four times, and it's frustrating as hell. But eventually, you get something that sounds like it's okay. Um, the same thing goes with sound effects. Sound effects are like I don't know, like mini songs. I guess they give more immersion into the world. And I don't know if there's like one good way to make sound effects for like games like this. Uh, basically, after you keep making a lot of them, you get a little better at guessing at, like, where should I start at with making sound effects, so maybe if I want to give the sound of something hitting the ground in the game, then I'll start with some, like, white noise, you know, mess around with that a bit, and throw on some, like, filters and effects until it sounds okay. Um, so it's sort of like sculpting, actually. Except I'm not good at sculpting. Um, <laughs> right, so I already showed you Reaper, which is the DAW that I use. Um, so the game story... So I had like ideas and thoughts that I wanted to convey through the game, and John came along and helped to, you know, impose this story over it that would help to express parts of those ideas that could be expressed in words. So that's been a very good thing John's done is helped to make the game more relatable and not abstract. Excuse me, what were your ideas and thoughts, and then what did John? How did John change that? Okay, and yeah, for a picture of, of what that process. Was. Um, so you know, I had like sort of these like ideas and like you know feelings that I wanted to convey through the game. You know, maybe one of them is sort of like you know fear in a way. And what I wanted to do at first was just have the player exploring all these areas that don't really say anything but sort of represent those things. But you know, John was like, okay, well we're gonna have to do a really good job if we want that to even be effective. And you know, maybe most of the players won't even realize it until they think the game is just totally weird and not there. So. You know, I thought it was a good compromise because we're not, neither of us are too experienced with doing this kind of thing. To, it would be a good compromise for John to help write a story that can help to convey some of those ideas in words. Not all of them, but, you know, a, a good amount of them. Um, does that answer the question at all? Yeah, it does to a degree. Okay. I, I was looking for, for what, because you, when you say story, I'm assuming through the whole action of the game there's a story that's ever unfolded. Yeah. So... What you mentioned was like fear. Well, like I had, was thinking of having a place where there's fear, but clearly the first concept was there's going to be a, this cascade of things going on. So you were thinking basically a cascade of different emotions. Yeah, exactly. And that's what determined the storyline then for you. So yeah, like he took those things and he mapped on a story that sort of conveys it. Some of them. And that was really good because I can't, I can't write. Because you were looking for it originally kind of a looser kind of thing. Yeah. So do you think you, you kind of you guys kind of compromised with each other because you thought the audience might not understand what you were saying? So I'm just saying, what if you were looking at a different audience? You know, if you decided to say you kind of market toward a particular audience that wasn't looking for that particular path. Right. Um, so you know, we wanted to market this towards you know, you know kids, maybe like even eight. You know, um, you know, mostly like people twenties, ten, teens who would play this. So in that respect, obviously, you know, if you're, like, not into sort of analyzing stuff, if you played something weird, you're just going to think it's weird, and, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, and then they'll also not really like it, and that's not really good if you're starting off and you actually, you know, kind of want to make a living off of this kind of thing. So, well, you know, I think the reason I say this because there's a lot of markets that opening in Valley, and the gaming has expanded out past that age, you know, yeah. and you're going to have people who are going to be looking for the game for the same kind of experience as they had so there might be something that you can expand into and actually develop more of a market. Yeah, I was hoping that you know people might be able to appreciate like the aesthetics enough to want to play it, even though if they're not usually the gamer type. So that was kind of like the like the big challenge we have, and you know, I don't know how successful we'll be in that respect, but at least I mean, we're trying. So, uh, yeah. Well, okay. So how does game design work? Um, Lots of notebook paper. 
writing stuff down and scratching stuff out and so forth. Where's the picture? Right there. That's a picture of game design. Um, lots of sketches and stuff that doesn't actually end up in the game. Um, Google Docs is great because you can edit a document and so can your friend. Um, good for like very uh, improvised to-do lists. Uh, Trello, which is this online website, which is basically like a more focused to-do list thing. Um, and then, of course, emails and chat. And a lot of things with these, like, organizational tools is that if you get way too into them, you're going to end up spending more time managing a to-do list and actually getting stuff done. So sometimes it's best to just jot the thing down you need to do rather than, you know, put a lot of thought into how I should place this thing on my to-do list. Anyways. Um... Right, so something's designed, then I'll go and program it, or he'll draw it, music, whatever, and then if it doesn't feel right, we'll just iterate it until it does feel right. And sometimes that can take forever. Um, i talk about that. Okay. Yeah, so usually, the funny thing is that I usually have placeholder art for a lot of stuff. Um, so one of the examples, on the bottom left is this crappy placeholder art I did for one of the guys, and on the right is the one John ended up making. As you can see, it looks at least a million times better. Um, and as I showed before, this is like my placeholder art for the dungeons and what he draws over it. Um, one last note, marketing. I don't know if anyone's going to make games, but I'll, who knows. Um, marketing, that ended up being something ridiculously important that I learned through making this. No one will know about your game unless you tell people about it. I mean, that's obvious. But even if your game is amazing, like, you're still going to have to tell people about it. Like, our game's not amazing enough to market itself, but there are games where, you know, people will be so impressed by it and they'll just share it with their friends and so forth. But in any case, it's always important, well, I found that it was very important to always be emailing the press and, you know, pressing for people, contacts and people you know, um, asking them, you know, who might be interested in talking about this to get more people to play it, because ultimately... Well, for the majority of game devs, one of the goals is to get a lot of people to play your game and experience it. I mean, there are devs who make games for just themselves or just one person. Um, but if the goal is, you know, you want a lot of people to play this and experience it, then you're going to have to bust your ass on, you know, telling people about the game. Um, so we've done okay so far in that regard. Like, we've gotten a number of, like, uh, like articles online and some decent gaming website and so forth. Um, right, so now we have like nine minutes left and if, answer any questions anyone has. If not, then I'll just show you guys something sort of amusing. Um, so does anyone have questions on anything? No? Nope? Okay. Um, uh, could you give, <laughs> I asked probably insane a question, but um, since you said this is sort of a side thing, uh, you're not, it's not part of your class work or anything like that. Could you give a guesstimate of how many hours you've spent on it so far? Uh, or any sense of time measure. You can, you can Probably like a thousand hours? That sounds about right for this game. Um, I mean, what happened was like, you know, I worked on it on and off during the school year. Summer came. I had like this like sort of full time job, but I would work on it at night, and that only went for seven weeks because of the internship. And then I would work on it just like every waking hour, more or less, for the rest of the summer. And then I do the same thing now. Like school is like my job, but after school, yeah. So this has been a pretty big time like commitment, and I've learned a lot. But after school, if this sells well, I mean, we're hoping. I'm hoping to like be able to just do like freelance game stuff until you know, hopefully this. Endeavor gets off, not maybe this game, but you know, future games, enough to support myself with enough money. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, people will be able to play a demo for what? Four tries, or is it a time limit, or is it a couple of days? Um, and it's, then it's just, it's, the demo is just like, a, it's like the first 15% of the game. So, it, you know, they play it and it gets to the end, and they're like, this is the end, you know, buy it if you want to play the rest. And that's just to give, you know, I think every game should have a demo because, like, you know, you, like sometimes, I don't know, like nowadays especially since it's so easy to give demos, you should really let the 
person be able to, you know, see if they're actually going to enjoy this and so forth. Like, that's what I think. Like, I always get frustrated when there's, like, a game and they don't have a demo. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to buy it. Is there anything else? Like, any ridiculous questions, really? I don't I'll answer anything. So one more thing before we're done. So an important thing in games is prototyping. And that means sort of getting the feel and idea of your game done before you go into full development. And uh, here's a prototype from one month into development that I made by myself. It's awful. Well, it was kind of fun, but it's, it's terrible. Okay. So here's the game. <laughs> Only one month of development. So you can see that there's like a lot of changes as time goes on. Um, this is totally like unplayable and there's just awful features like, you know, see um, this room's like the wrong direction. Um, you know, what are these? Um, yeah, but, you know, the important thing about prototyping is making sure the game's actually even a little bit fun. Like, even though this looked like crap, like, I still found some enjoyment in walking through these awful looking rooms. <laughs> Alright. Yeah, so there's, there's been a lot of progress in the past like, six months, five months, I don't know. Um, yeah. So, that's been using my... Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thanks for not falling asleep and showing up. Alright. Yeah, that's Thank it. You. Yeah.